Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Our first guest is the Executive Vice Chairman for Bridging the Gap and founder for Rock to Recovery. Please welcome Wesley Gear. Hi, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Hey, man, yeah. it's a pleasure. Yeah. I heard a lot about you from uh, Marissa Semense uh, nice. on our, our management team. Old and friend. Then I did some research, and I was like, whoa. So we just stepped our game up having you here. Thanks. Oh, all right. I'll, <laughs> I'll take it. I'm glad you didn't hear about me from the police department. Well, I That's got good. that record, too, but I was trying to stay away from that, man. I'm trying, trying to, to get an expunged, you know? <laughs> well, we've got Prop 47 help here, too, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> so, Wesley, um, your background as a musician, mm -hmm. just share with those who are watching a little bit about you. Uh, I moved a lot as a kid, and uh, when I moved and I was 15, around there, 14 or 15, I, I discovered the guitar. I'd been exposed to music my whole life, but I think uh, when you're young, it didn't have much of a meaning. I, I grew up with classical music, it was just like a part of life, but then when I heard rock guitar, about 15, moved to a new place, didn't have any friends, that was my best friend. That was it, huh? Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And then I, I told us about Head P.E., where, where I, that about? Yeah, I had a bunch of really, you know, not so great bands, and then right. we kind of made a hybrid of some local bands that could get a few hundred people to shows. Um, right. And the singer and I started Head PE, uh, Jared, and then brought in some other bandmates, and that got got me my first record deal okay. on Jive Records. We were talking before yeah. the camera started rolling. Yeah. Yeah. We called it G Punk because we were fusing, like, because we loved gangster rap, all the Snoop Dogg stuff, and we loved, you know, the punk rock, rudimentary peni, and we were trying to fuse the stuff together. And uh, Jive's a hip-hop label, you right. know, they started Absolutely. East Coast Hip Hop, so what, they wanted to sign us out here, and we're like, what? Okay, <laughs> yeah, that sounds real good to us. <laughs> right. You know? right, and then, so you're rolling, and then all of a sudden, 2003, you have something that changes in your life as well. Well, the reality is of my record deal is I had bands that didn't do so well, and then I got really into getting loaded and heavy drugs, and then my band started doing really well. Head, I got a record deal while I was on a lot of drugs. So I thought, well, this is my spinach, like Popeye, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. And so for a while I felt like I had magic powers on that stuff, and then slowly the things I thought it was doing for me it was actually start working in reverse, right? I wasn't creative, I wasn't functional, I wasn't making more friends, being more artistic. And I toured you know, the world for a while, drinking a lot of whiskey and doing a lot of that stuff we do, and then finally uh, it ended me up in a rehab, yeah. Now, when you say you toured the world, I also read about you being with Korn from yeah. 2010 to 13. How did that transition happen from your own group uh, to Korn? Was that all a part of that same period of time? It's quite a testament to the path of recovery. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a spring chicken. Um, <clears throat> I left Head, I want to say in my late 30s, and uh, I did this thing they called recovery. They said, you put your recovery first, don't worry about the job or the house or the wife or any of those things you want. Focus on recovery and getting healthy. And it was a long, slow process. My brain said, uh, you're not going to play music again, right? You're sober now. And sober people don't play music. And that's the problem with people when they get sober is their brain tells them things that aren't true, but you don't go, hey, brain, you're lying to me. You right. go, yeah, that's true, right? right, right. So, but people told me, you, you can have the white, uh, life of your wildest dreams, you stay sober. And so after I was sober about three years the second time, because I got loaded again at about two years when I stopped working on recovery. So was about sec uh, two years in, the second time, um, I started praying and meditating, going, universe, I think I want to get back into music. I think I have some unfinished business there. And right about 10 days after I did this meditation for manifestation, mm -hmm. where you visualize it, I got a, I got a text from the guys in corn. Hey, wow. you want to come play with us? I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is weird. This prayer meditation stuff everybody's been right. talking about for thousands and thousands of years right, right, works, right. you know. Uh -huh. um, and I got, got to tour with corn. Uh, they wanted me in the band because I was sober. Ah. So that lie of my head saying music right, right. and sobriety don't mix, the right. universe was like, no, you're a musician. And right. uh, I got to do that and go around the world and remember shows and be present and play well and not all drunk. Totally different perspective, huh? Ah, oh, it's the best thing ever. And, and I got to deal with the fear, too, because I was, you know, I made a, a habit my whole life of, uh, of, you know, numbing myself out, not feeling the right. past, not feeling the present. Um, so... You know, part of recovery is we get stronger because we go through the stuff we used to do loaded, sober. And when you learn how to do it sober, you're now a stronger person. So 
I got to play Blind, which is Korn's like, you know, most famous uh, song, you know, trademark song. I'd have to do the intro by myself on a crowd of 80,000 people. Wow. It's not even a hard part, but my heart is doing bat- backwards, <laughs> do, 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 you know, because I know all the Korn fans are listening. Don't screw this up. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, yeah, usually I'd have a few shots of whiskey to get me through this. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, that's the beauty of the experience, well, too. Whiskey to, fe- to adrenaline getting you Yeah, feeling. Thing. We want to yeah. feel, right? right and, right, you know, right. the, the people who uh, struggle with addiction, they don't want to feel. You know? So for those who are watching who may be struggling or who have friends who are struggling, when, when you start to find that road to recovery, I would imagine those old friends who are still there and stuck, that might, must be somewhat of a, a distraction too, where they're like, why yeah. are you trying to go that way, come back this way? How yeah. do you become strong enough to, to break away from all of that and, and stay on that, the right path? Well, you know, for me, I didn't do it my way. I didn't go, here's my plan for recovery, because I tried to change a long time. I let people tell me what the suggestion was for success. Gotcha. So okay. I went to a treatment center in uh, Long Beach, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Newfound Life, and I went for, I, I told them I just want to go 30 days. And about 20 days in, I was like, I'm not ready for the world yet. I, I'm barely, you know, coming out of the clouds, out of the fog. So I did that for a couple of months, and then they said, you know, we recommend you go to a sober living. And that's what I did. So I had to take that ego of like, hey, I was on a tour bus, look at me, and go, okay, I'll share a room with a few dudes who wake me up and keep, because it kept me safe. I wasn't ready to go back to Huntington Beach. And I had to make a new network of friends. And it wasn't that they had to be my best friends necessarily, but they had to be like if we are in battle, right? right. I may not know you, but we got to save each other's lives right. and get each other's back. Right. And that's right. what it's about. Yeah. So I had a posse of people who were on the same path as, as I was, which is let's not get loaded no matter what. Right. Now, as you're going through all of this, I understand, too, you got to that place where you found that it wasn't just about you, it was about giving back to the community, and that became really important to you as well. Yeah, you know, the truth of that whole thing is that um, when you're a musician, it, nothing is guaranteed. It could go away tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know, and, there's a, and that, that, that always had me living with a lot of fear. So this time when I was in that position with Korn that had a lot of notoriety, and, you know, and it gave me a lot of visibility as a person, and it makes people listen to what you say and the ideas you have. You know, there's some spiritual texts I was reading in my recovery, and the, the whole time I was talking to God, like, you know, I need a career. <laughs> what do you want me to do? And it says you can pray for yourself if others are to be helped, right? Don't just go give me a million dollars. So I said, okay, God. I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, and I'm a musician. How can I help people but using what I've been given in my life? And that's when the idea of Rock to Recovery came to me. Mm-hmm. Like, why don't you just go write songs with people in treatment? Um, so I went down that path with, uh, with doing something, giving backward. Right? Right. It started as a nonprofit, and then what I'm here for. Right. And that's bridging the gap. Bridging so the gap. We have five minutes, and I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about that. And I know we have a guitar. We, we we bring that in yet, or what do you think? Sure, why not? How about that? Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about bridging the gap and what you've got here as well. All right. So um, yeah, it's a nice little axe, as we call it, right? Yeah. Um, bridging the gap. Uh, I had a good friend named Duke Collins. And we played backyard parties together, clubs together in my original, my first band, Head P.E. And we partied together. And, uh, you know, I went on to get sober. And uh, he was struggling in and out, you know, because we have this mindset saying, no, I got this. I'll get it right this time. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't get it. He, he passed away from a drug overdose. Um, so, again, back to the prayer meditation, you know, if you... If I heard the story from the other side long ago, I probably wouldn't have believed it. But I started, I've started. i gotten this practice of sometimes talking to like my father who passed away, and I swear I, get, I hear their voices. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't talked to Duke in a while. He had been, he passed on, right? And I, I was praying and meditating, and I was like, hey, Duke, how you doing, man? Miss you. And I was just having this conversation in my mind, and I said, uh, I said, well, is there anything you want me to do down here? And I heard this thing, get a hold of my mom. I was like, Oh, okay, get a hold of your mom. I didn't know Duke's mom. And within the next 24 hours, I think, or 48 hours, we connected. And she's like, yes, I got a message from Duke that we are supposed to connect. I'm getting chills right now thinking about it. Wow. And she goes, I want to I uh, 
not have his passing be for nothing. Um, I want to form a charity uh, organization in his name. Now, Duke's issue was that he had a functional life, and he wasn't against going to treatment, but how do you sustain that life when you do? The car payment, the house payment, how, how, life, the, you know, the people want to get paid. Right, right. And that was his thing that he spoke to his mom about. Yeah, mom, I, I know I need help. You know, they had a great relationship, but, but how do I put my life on hold? So Bridging the Gap is in his honor, uh, designed to help people um, financially when they have to go away and get treatment and get help. Um, and so <clears throat> we're going to do it where when people go to treatment and, they, and we know they have a program of recovery they're following, mm -hmm. we'll help them financially if they're sticking to their program, not just freebies, but like, yeah, you're going to the meetings or whatever you need, whatever we decide is the, the, the plan of treatment. Um, so that, that's what Bridging the Gap's all about. We don't want to lose people. We don't have to lose right. unnecessarily. And how will the guitar play into this? So Bridging the Gap is brand new. And another one of my homies who did play in uh, Suction, which turned into the Deadlights, that was Duke's band, the Deadlights, amazing band, uh, Jerry Montano. He's friends with the guys in Avenge Sevenfold. I think most of you out there in TV land know who that I see is. Everybody back there shaking their heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Avenge Sevenfold. Those guys are badass. Can I say badass? Well, you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a guitar that they um, that Jerry talked to them about, and they donated, and they put all their autographs on here. Um, the whole band, which is amazing. Sometimes you get one or two guys, but this has a whole band on it, and it's a. Uh, it's a legit, good guitar, really nice, made by Schechter, who donated it. And uh, what we're going to do is auction this baby off okay. to help raise some money for Bridging the Gap. And how do people find out about the auction? So right now, the best way to find out about it is we're going to put it on a site called Give Some, Give and some. we'll put it on our Facebook page, Bridging okay. the Gap Recovery. Can we do some words at the bottom yeah, of the screen in post-production? Oh, yeah. So see right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know, but we'll give you that information. It's Bridging okay. the Gap Recovery, and we have a Facebook page called Bridging the Gap. Okay. We'll have information. It's going to be on an eBay auction. Cool. Um, if you use keywords like Bridging the Gap and Avenge Sevenfold Autograph, you'll be able to find it for sure. We're out of time, man, but you've given a lot of information. I wish I had a whole show with you. We got to bring you back. I think we covered it, Will though. Will you come back again? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Maybe we can even get you to do a few licks for us. While okay, you're yeah, for sure. Right, no problem. Deal. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will be speaking with Yegi Kayala Watts of Heart C Comprehensive Development. Stay tuned for more of Long Beach Lens.